ladies and gentlemen. The Kids in the Room Podcast. The Kids in the Room Podcast. That's right. That's right. Brought to you by Moo Faces TV. Woo! All right, all right, all right. Hey, guys. Welcome to the Kids in the Room Podcast. Today, we've got Jeffrey Klein on the show. Jeffrey, what's going on? What's going on? Not much. Just uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Always get to bring somebody on the actual show, on the actual uh, podcast, and have great conversations. So, yeah, man, tell us, tell, tell our audience a little bit more about who you are. Uh, so, I'm a dad and a husband, but enough about my family. I'm a family guy first, but uh, my love is is about connecting the dots by thinking outside the box. That's why I like to. That's my kind of company line. But I'm a visual content producer, so I help people tell visual stories. Uh, whether it's through animation, video, graphics, um, a TEDx speaker, an adjunct professor, and I love having great conversations. So that there sounds, you go. That sounds like a deal. We're going to have a great yeah. conversation on this uh, show. All right. So yeah, tell me a little bit more about, um, you know, what you do and with uh, on the TEDx, because you, you said you were on TEDx. What, what, tell us a little bit more about the TEDx. Sure. Uh, so I've done a lot of speaking in my career, whether formally or informally. And when I decided I wanted to make that a bigger part of kind of what I did in terms of sharing what I believe is really helpful to serve the world in terms of the power of story and people to communicate more effectively. Uh, I've always been a huge fan of, of TED Talks. I think they're really amazing in, in their mission and how people, lots of different um topics. And so I decided to see if I might be able to share what I thought about my perspective. So I applied and there was a, a process through which I applied to only one. I, I called about another one, but they'd already filled their speaker. So it was, uh, I'm from Philadelphia. And unfortunately at the time, TEDx Philadelphia wasn't really um, operational. So I applied to one in, in just north of, of Philadelphia, in the Lehigh Valley. And uh, I was really lucky because the woman who runs it, uh, Lisa Gensler, was awesome. And the way TEDx works is basically they have people that have the license to put on the conference. And so going through the interview process, one of the things she asked me was how open I was to kind of take my initial idea and kind of expand the idea to, to be more than it. And I said, yeah, I'm all for it. And she was really an amazing coach. Uh, and really to me, even when you're successful, um, I think the most successful people recognize the importance of a coach. Now I say that as the son of an executive coach and a husband of a professional coach. Um, so I'm kind of uh, biased in that, but I do believe that people can take you from here to there, uh, having that outside perspective. And so my talk was called, you know, um, you know, uh, about story and, and making one that, that matters to the audience. So story matters, tell one that matters to your audience. And it was a great experience and really, summarizes a lot of, of what I believe from my worldview in terms of the best way to tell a story, why story matters, the science behind it. Um, and it's it's been a great, great experience that continues. It's the gift that keeps on giving. I, I've been able to give it to people and people seem to appreciate it. And uh, I'm just happy about that. Sweet. So Jeffrey, why do stories matter? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of reasons why stories matter. So my belief is real simple. So I believe that as human beings, we're trying to connect with people. And in order to do that, we need to communicate effectively. My belief, which is backed by science, is that the best way to do that is by telling a story. And it comes down to how our brains work. So there was an experiment done by a neuroscientist, Ori Hassan, uh, who was at the time at Princeton. And he was curious about how our brains behaved based on the input it received. So he had two groups. He had one audience that was given data, facts, figures, or in the marketing world, features and benefits. And two parts of their brains activated, the Broca's area and the Vernix area. Hugely important areas of your brain because they're responsible for decoding meaning so that we understand the words that are coming out of each other's mouths. But then he had a second group that were told stories. And their brain activity was super different. Not only did the Broca's and the Vernix area activate, but so their, their brains lit up. But not only did the brains light up, but they lit up with the parts of the brain that the listener would use if they were experiencing the story themselves. So I always think of it as like vicariously experiencing the story. So that if I told you a story about me kicking a ball, 
your motor cortex would actually activate. There's also an increase in the levels of cortisol and oxytocin, the stress hormone and the love hormone. And that's, I think, when a lot of people talk about stories being emotional connected. So both from a sensory perspective and an emotional connection, if I'm trying to get something through to you and I tell you a story, I'm much more likely for you to get it because there's an increase in both understanding and retention. And so I look at it from a business perspective, what are, what as marketers are we trying to do? We're get, trying to get people to understand the value of our product or service and then to remember it so that when I, you see an ad a few days later, you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. And by using story, you're much more likely to resonate with an audience, to have them connect with it and hence want to, want to buy from you. Right, right, right. Totally. I, I get it exactly because you do, you know, when you are telling a story, you are trying to connect, you know, with the other, you know, end user, right? You're really trying to connect and, and you're really trying to market whatever you're promoting or you're selling or you're trying to express to the world. And so, you know, having that really clean cut story or a well curated story really matters when it comes down to you know, branding or building a business, you, you know, it's, it's all about the story. It's all about the story. Every brand has a story, no matter what you want to call it. Yeah. And, and, and just to, to highlight that point, there's a, there's a concept they came up with called neural coupling, which is when I said, I kick a ball, you, your motor quarter. So they found that the brain activity of both the speaker and the listener mirror one another. You actually can look at the brain scans and they actually are mirroring one another. And that's why it's, you know, talk about being on the same page, uh, your brains are in sync. And that's why it's so powerful as a marketing tool. Now, what do you mean your brains are in sync? Like, how do you, how do you, how are you getting your brains in sync with the other person? Like, mark me in that. When, so, yeah, when you, so this neural coupling concept is that when I'm explaining and describing things to you, my brain activity mirrors your brain, or actually your brain activity mirrors my activity, as if you, again, were experiencing what I'm talking about. So I'll give you an example. I'm like, I like to bake. And if I'm like, you know, a, a week ago, I was with my son and we decided we we're going to bake. We couldn't decide what to bake. We decided to bake chocolate chip cookies. And, you know, I could smell the chocolate chips and then we put them in the oven. And when 10 minutes later, we opened the oven, the aroma of cookies just came out. And it was like, oh yeah, this is a good batch. While I'm telling you that story, your olfactory, your set, your flavor senses are activating. So you weren't there in the kitchen with me while we were baking, but your brain is acting as if you were. So you're actually re-experiencing or experiencing the story that I had already experienced. And my, by me telling that to you, you're connecting with me because it, your brain is saying, oh my God, the, the smell of fresh baked cookies. And your brain activity is acting as if it was experiencing it in that moment. Wow, that's interesting. So your brain is acting as if it's experiencing it. I mean, I mean that makes sense. Like when somebody's telling a story, if the story's really vivid and well thought out, it, you know, we feel like we're actually a part of it. We're, we're walking with that person. So a person who can tell a really good story um, can really get that uh, that vision, you know, across to the uh, the end user or the people. Right? I think that really matters. Well, I'll tell you, my favorite part of, of this kind of concept is so you'll tell, you know, if you if you have a really good story and you'll share it with your friend and then who you see at a party or something. And what sometimes happens is a few weeks later, a month later, you'll see that friend and that friend has incorporated your story to the point that they now retell it to you, forgetting that it was your story. They've appropriated it and incorporated it as their own story. <laughs> That's pretty much, you know. The goal, if you're not telling my story as if it were your own, that's a good story that you want to tell to others. Now, wait a minute. Now, are you saying that somebody's actually telling the story back to you that you told them? Yes. See, I have... they, they, they forget who told them the story. They just remember the story was so good that they want to, they want to retell it. And so they've forgotten that you were the person who told it to them. So they're retelling it to you. And you're like, yeah, I told you that story a few weeks is ago. That, is that what that is? That shit drives me crazy. That drives me crazy. I always tell stories, and then I, 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 I sometimes reflect and think maybe it's certain people who do it. Because it's certain people where I tell a story, they'll come back and regurgitate that out to me. And I'm like, hey, man, or a person. That's my story. That's my f I, just, I, just, I just fucking told you that. Well, I think you should take it as a big compliment. See? I really think because what's what's happening is so the problem's your me. story is so compelling that they're retelling it as if it were their own. 
That's they're fair. not doing it consciously to try and steal your story. See, and they they're doing it because it's a good story. Okay, so by the way, that that's that's thanks for solving that fucking problem because that <laughs> I really feel like it's a it's a pet peeve of mine. I'm like, hey, mm-hmm. don't come. I even I, I get the same thing with ideas. You know, there's ideas that come out, right? And then like I'll tell someone an idea and I'll, I'll tell it in a you know the way that I feel that you know needs to get it across. I like to get vivid with it. And then they'll come back and they'll, yeah, you know, I had this idea. And I'm like, hey, fucker, that's my fucking idea. I told you that. What do you mean? <laughs> so I'm not recommending that it's okay for people to steal your ideas. Let me be clear about that. You know, as a trained lawyer and copyright's really important to me, trademark's important. Um, but in the context of people wanting to share your story or your idea, it proves the strength of that story or idea that they've gotten to the point where they've connected with it. I mean, that's what you're trying to do when you tell a story, you're trying to get people to connect. Well, I must they've be. connected with it on such a level, a mm-hmm. subconscious level, that they're now, you know, sharing it back to you. It, it, I'm sure it can be a little annoying, but I think if you recognize that's because I told a really good story that they loved it so much that they wanted to, they've, they've incorporated it unconsciously. Well, Jeffrey, I think that's amazing. Cause like for me, I'm always taking it as a point to where it's like, Hey, they're repeating the same exact thing that I already told them, and it's driving me fucking crazy. It feels like a recorder just replaying things over and over again. I'm like, hey, 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 wait a minute. Yeah, and I think, I think the reason people find it frustrating is because then you think they're not listening to you when you're telling the story. Because you're like, if you didn't listen when I was telling the story, and now you're telling it, you don't remember that I told you the story. And, and yes, you want people to remember it's your story. But the silver lining of that experience is they are remembering that story well enough and and liking the story well enough that they want to make it their own. So and so I think that there is value in that, but sure, there's a line you don't want you don't want people to go and you know tell the story. I, I mean, I I'll tell you uh, kind of correlate to that, which is so my father, been around a long time, he's 81 years old. He's got lots of good stories. Um I I've, I've appropriated some, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've appropriated some of those stories as my own, okay. you know, but I, they're, they're, you know, I, I guess it's, it's the intention behind how you're using that story. I mean, you know, Jeffrey, I, 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 I agree, but there's just, there's just, there's this problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. <laughs> and my problem is I feel like it's plagiarism. You're stealing my shit. You're taking my stuff and then you're acting like it's yours. Stop, stop, stop. So what I would recommend is that I'm not I'm not uh, promoting plagiarism in any form at all, unless it's from my father. Like I, I take his story. I think it's within the family. It's verbal it's plagiarism, well. by the way. <laughs> Pardon? Verbal plagiarism. Yeah, verbal plagiarism. Um, We're making. I don't shit. recommend that, and I think it's really important as someone who works in marketing and who who's trained as a lawyer that you give credit to the right people. So I'm a big proponent of that. So let me be clear. I'm just explaining part of the reason why some people may do that. Because there's a difference between someone loving a story and telling it back to you and someone who listens to your story and then intentionally decides, I'm going to steal that story. I'm going to make it my own story and I'm not going to give him credit. But Jeffrey. So I think that there's, there's a distinction to be made. Okay. Okay. Fine. 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 Fine, Jeffrey. Fine. But, <laughs> but, 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 big buts. I'm saying, listen here. I get it. I get it. I'm listening to you. It makes sense. Sounds great. I'm on it. I'm sold. But my problem is <sighs> they are I, – I feel like it's from certain people. I could tell the same story to other people, and it may not resonate. And I mean, it may not come back out the same way as I just told these certain t- type of people or personality, tri- uh, personality types just come back and say it to me. Again and again and again. I'm like, dude, they always say my story and then say like it's theirs. Yeah, you know, I was thinking of this. Or yeah, you know, I heard, you know, there was this one time, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, man, that's my story. Like, why do you keep on? It's like, is it certain type of people that are more receptive to this? Is there like a radar or well, uh, brain pattern? I'm not sure. I'm not. Again, let me be clear to things. Let's do a I'm test. not a scientist. So <laughs> even though I, I, I read a lot about this, I'm not a neuroscientist. Um and again, I think the distinction is the integrity of those individuals. So if you have people who are doing it or telling your stories to try and make money or telling those stories to look good to other people, that's not right. And I don't, I, I don't condone that. Um, 
if it's innocent enough and you're like and you're like dude that's my story I'm like oh yeah yeah I, for I, I forgot you told me that story like that's you know that's the distinction about what what, what is the reality of their intention and their integrity about sharing that story um i because i don't think you should steal people's ideas i have lots of stories that i don't want people stealing my stories 100 that's part yeah. of my intellectual property um <laughs> but it's just a fact that our brains are hearing these stories are resonating with them and in some instances we'll retell them i mean here i don't i'm not saying that happens all the time where someone takes your story and then retells it but here is what happens i tell a really good story to someone and then that person then shares hey i heard this amazing story from jeffrey you got to hear it. and then retell that that's the appropriate way i think it should be done you know saying yeah i heard this great story from my friend tavares and then you know that's so i'm all about that i mean Jeffrey, I'm all about that too. That's that's so you're still tagging the author, right? You're you're socially tagging the author right. verbally, and that's what matters. You know, right. it's like giving credit. If you sure. know who you've actually heard this from, or you spoke of this person, like literally paint it out that way, so you can just like give that author that credit, man. Yeah. But there are times where I've I've heard some, you know, I've heard things, and I'm like, I can't remember where I heard that. But I think that again, even if you don't know the author, you don't know the source, be honest about it. Be like, I'm not sure where I heard this story, but so that you're not taking ownership of something that doesn't belong to you. And I, I agree with that, but it's annoying when you sometimes hear the same person say that shit all the time. I don't know where I heard no. this from, but did you know? <laughs> what do you mean, did I know? I'm the author of oh. no. What do you mean? <laughs> Come on, man. So, so perhaps <laughs> you should, you as the author of those stories, should maybe you should test them a bit. Those same people start feeding them different information and see what comes back. No, I'm just, I'm, I, I think again, you have to just meet people where they are. And, and um, it, it's, I would say my, my recommendation is to try and have empathy for them. There's a reason that they're doing it. There's a good reason. And maybe there's a less good reason. Um, yeah. I'm about, I'm about all reasons. I'm about all reasons. That's fine. <laughs> it's just a pet peeve of mine. I think everybody has their own thing. And that's one of my things. You know, you take my, after you, 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 you've intimately spoken to me multiple times and we had this intimate conversation and you chose to forget that I'm the fucking author. Why? No. So maybe you should start writing these down and start know, recording it, making sure that yeah, recording it, make sure it's all <laughs> covered and then be like, wait, here, let me play something back for you. Actually, with those people, you should start recording the, their those conversations, and then you can play it back to them, and they'll be like, "Wait, oh yeah, that that was you." You know, but you know that's Human so nature. that's so time consuming. You know, it's just the point where it's just like you know, I'm already frustrated by that point. At that point, I'm already at you know, it was a zero, but now I'm at a hundred or at least one hundred and five. Uh, yeah, because when it's repetitively done, it's just like, are you listening to me? Are you really, really paying attention to what I've said or you just weren't even there, but you heard and now you don't even remember that I was there? Like, how much of attention are you paying? Yeah. Well, you love the story, often, but you didn't pay attention to the author. Right. And our attention spans are pretty short and pretty, you know, uh, it's it's a challenge. And that's part that's another reason why stories are so powerful, because our attention spans are so short. And when you have that rise in cortisol, that's the fight or flight hormone. It actually is when someone says, I want to tell you a story, your cortisol goes up and it makes you alert and makes you pay attention more. So again, another reason why story matters. So your cortisone level, like can you can you can you artificially cortisol. Cortisol, excuse me. Can you mm -hmm. artificially uh, you know, produce this cortisol per se? Oh yeah. There are drugs, there are <laughs> there are So I can I can force somebody to make to listen to my story. And maybe maybe right. slip them something or, or slip share them something. A, a, a cortisol <laughs> pill or something like this, right? Yeah, there are. I'm sure there are. Yeah. I wonder if uh, but it, but I I don't. I'm not recommending that because uh, cortisol can have some pretty detrimental effects. I think as well if you don't what are those? regulate it properly. What are those? Well, you can. You know, it's a stress hormone, so people can become aggressive. People can, like there's other things that could go on. And again, I'm not a medical professional or healthcare professional. So I'm, I'm definitely going to put a disclaimer out that I'm not recommending anyone mess with cortisol levels in others. The natural cortisol that happens when you're telling some of the story is as much as I would like to share. Awesome. I was just wondering. But I hear what you're, I hear what you're saying. You want to, you want to try and, yeah. you know, find a way to get people to pay attention and, and credit you. I mean, so. it's just like, a, it could be a miracle ADD 
pill, right? I want you to pay attention to the rest order. Just <laughs> stick you with that instead of this Adderall shit. <laughs> but but in a way, you can get people's attention by just telling really good stories. And then you don't have to get, have that artificial stuff. You know, I mean, but does that work on people who have ADD? Like, you know, telling a really good story? Like, do you have to have a really good story or does it have to be a story that is like really interesting towards them? Right. I think that's a key point. And, and the answer is I don't know. I'm not, I don't work with ADHD children. I have to ask, I have a cousin who's a professor. I'll ask him about that. Um, but I think there is a really important um, takeaway with what you just said, which is when you're telling stories and you want people to pay attention, you need to make sure that you remember the 11th commandment. Do you know the 11th commandment? No. What is, what is, what is the, well, I made it up. So, okay. so you better give me credit when you share this with other people. So I'm telling you For now sure. on record. Jeffrey Klein told me about the 11th commandment. It's not the 10th. It's the 11th. There we go. No, thy the 11th commandment is know thy audience. Ooh. And what that means is when you're telling a story, you need to make sure that it's of interest and value to them. You know, there's a, the, the old expression, and I don't know who, where this came from. So I'll, the W, the most popular radio station, W I I F M. Have you heard of that before? I have not. Yeah, W I I F M. It's the most popular radio station that doesn't exist. Wow. It stands for "What's in it for me?" W I I F M. <laughs> What's in it for me? Okay. I know. I wish I could take credit for creating it, but I don't. I have to maybe try and find give credit to who it is. But the point is that, and I do say this to a lot of people. I say nobody cares about what you do. I know that's might be distressing. Nobody cares about what you can do. Nobody cares what your business can do. They only care, people only care about what your business can do for them. Right. So when you're telling a story and you're saying, we're so great and we've won this award and we won, nobody cares. They don't care about your accolades. They only care about how you can help them. So when you're telling those business stories, you want to make sure it's focused on who you serve and how you serve them. Otherwise, they're not going to pay attention. Hmm. I mean, that's interesting. So how could you correlate that with social media? How could you correlate that with, you know, movies, TV, things like that? Show me what's going on. All right. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the social media one because it's a little easier to more grasp. straightforward. Go ahead. Um, so, I, so back in 350 AD, there was this dude named Aristotle. And he kind of is known as kind of the grandfather of story. And he created the three-act structure, beginning, middle, and end. You look at any movie and TV shows, in some form, they're working on those beginning, middle, and ends. You know, that's the kind of journey we like to follow along. Right. So in modern times, it's like, okay, well, what? how do we craft a, a story with a beginning, middle, and end that's going to resonate and capture the attention of someone and be interested in, you know, the what's in it for them part? So I created something, and there's variations of this, but this is my version of it. I call it the story pad, the P-A-D. And the P-A-D represent the beginning, the middle, and the end of your business story. So what's the P stand for? The beginning of your story. And this is how, how you're saying in social media and other ways, how do you capture that attention right away? You start with the P, which is the pain or the problem of your potential customer. So um, I'll give you an example. Let's say I use the, the um, example of, you know, you got a dent in your car. So the commercial starts, you got a little bump, you know, fender bender, you know, wanting to patch up your, you know, make it look good because you got a date. So immediately if I've been in a little fender bender, I have a little scuff, someone opened their door, any of these things, I'm like, yeah, that is me. And immediately I'm going to pay attention because they're speaking to me because I've experienced that. So I'm like, okay, what you got? And you get to the A, the middle of the which is the answer. You got the problem and the answer. The answer is the product or service that helps solve whatever it is that's wrong. So, you know, hey, have you been in a fender bender? Come to our auto body shop to help fix it. You know, we've got, you know, experts and buffing out and blah, blah, blah. And that's where a lot of businesses stop. They say, here's a problem, here's the answer. But the D to me is critical and is what separates good versus great stories. So you have the problem and you have the answer. And then what's the D, the end of the story? The D is the difference that it makes in your or your business. So if you think about it, you start the story, have you been in a fender bender? There's your problem. Yes, I've been a fender bender. Don't worry, you know, we can fix it. Klein's autos can come and scratch. 
great. And now you'll be able to go on that date and impress, you know, your friends with how, you know, or your wife will be happy because she hasn't seen the den or fill in the blank of how does that impact? Because by sharing the impact, that's where you're going to connect with people on that other level. Of like not only are you solving the problem, but you're sharing with them the impact it's going to have on them. And that's, you know, I believe in keeping things simple. So there's a way on social media where you can basically you start with a question or you explain, here's Bob, he's had this issue, or here's Jane, she's had that issue. You start there because when you speak about that problem that or pain that a customer has, they're going to pay attention because they're, they're experiencing something bad and they want to fix it. And then you come and fix it. As opposed to what some people says, we're the best auto shop in the tri-state area or whatever it may be. You haven't got me yet because I don't even know what you're talking. You know, you're talking about solutions to problems I don't know that I even have. <laughs> so I always, you know, I haven't. And then they say, you know, have you been in a fender better? And I'm like, wait, wait, yeah. But it's by then you've already told them half the story and they haven't been paying attention. So yeah. that's my my advice is always start with the pain, think about who you help and how you help them. Awesome. P A D problem answer difference in oh in yeah that's it I, I think what we call that in uh in, in in product is morally the takeaway right what did you what did you take away sure. from it you know mm -hmm. so there's the problem and then there's what was the middle one again the answer, answer. You, know, you, you think of the, the the middle is your product or service that fixes right. the problem so you're saying it's the pad so it's the problem the pad the answer the answer the and difference the difference oh yeah, a lot of people, uh, I've heard other people describe like, you know, what's the transformation, the change? You know, you have you have a problem, the product then helps you, and then you've changed in some positive way. Let me explain how that's, that's the difference or the impact that you, you have by by engaging in that business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think there's like, there's like a, uh, what is it? I think it, there's, there's a, hold on, there's a, let me say the trying to think of how it is i should know this i should know this already if i had but there's also um what do you call it it's called the uh in uh product design there's a thing called the star method which is basically called the situation the task mm -hmm. the action and the result which is a similar pad kind of structure except you're adding more of you know um you're separating the problem to more of a situation and then kind of a task is kind of like broken down but it has a similar sure. essence. Yeah. Again, as I said, this is my version. There are other versions that exist. Um, for me, the story pad was a simple way of me articulating it to people in the context of telling stories. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's again, it's, but I think the takeaway from this is a, make sure you're focused on your audience. Know thy audience. Yeah. Because if you don't know, no matter what story you're telling, if you don't know your audience, connect with the audience, it, it's a waste of time. Right. I mean, cause matter. you, I mean, cause you have this thing where, you know, you know, who are you, you know, what's the problem you're solving and then how, what was the journey to investigate your solution? Right. And then you have the solution and then you have the testing and you have the results, right. Which would mm -hmm. be your takeaway, right. which is kind of like, you know, here, Very it's pretty much the same. It's interchangeable to that way, but it's, 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 it's interesting. So it's like solving problems all have a similar layer or structure no matter what right. throughout life. So that is yeah. scientific. There's a scientific basis to it. Yes. Nice. If you think about experiments, they have a hypothesis and then they have a, you know, they test it and then they have the results. So right. But if you're going to explain um, that to somebody who doesn't know, you need to describe the situation, how you came to this conclusion or solution. Right. And then the takeaway yep. from that. So it all makes sense to someone. So I think the thing is, is trickier is, is like, you know, when you're explaining it to others, it's really explaining them your solution or how you, your journey to getting that solution. And, you know, how did you come to this hypothesis or conclusion before instead of just saying, oh, I have this, you know, I think that's more of a deeper scientific method versus the PAD, which is more of the problem answer. And uh, what was the D? Uh, the, uh, the difference. The difference. Yeah. 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 And I think, again, it's, it's um, in terms of how complex you get. You start, I always think you start simple and then you layer in those elements that are going to make it, you know, because I also think that the story that you tell depends on where someone is in the journey. Right. So if you, you know, we talk about aware, you know, the kind of um, customer journey, you know, the sales journey that someone takes, someone who's never heard of your product or service, you're going to tell a different story than if they're 
already an existing customer. And so again, know thy audience. Where are they in the process will depend on how deep you go. So I have I have had clients who want to give every detail about what they do. I'm like, no, that, that to to you know as a promotional thing. And I'm like, not yet. That will become important. You know the the you know kind of the workings and the operations of of your thing. But if you're trying to get uh, someone to be aware of what you do, start with them. What's their problem? Then you introduce your product or your service. So it's always about how do you get them, you know, get that awareness first. The awareness you get is by making sure you're resonating with what they care about. And that's interesting. You know, sometimes when you're like, you know, spraying and praying, you know, throughout, right. for example, your product, your podcast, your whatever, your show or whatever you're pushing out there to the world. It's like you're you have an, a, a, a wide variance of an audience. Right. So it's like, you know. They could, and these all could be possibly, you know, your uh, audience in general, right? But it's like, how do you, how do you can, you know, put together or convey a message that spreads, or kind of permeates every single individual, uh, or, or as much as possible as you can when you're doing it through your social group. It's very hard and not recommended. So if you, I would say, that, you know, best practices in terms of marketing is not to try to be everything to everybody. It's too hard and expensive to do it. Now, the beauty of something like social media is that you don't need to. You know, when you think about the old paradigm of marketing, which was more of a broadcast, you know, you're on TV and, you know, radio, and it's you don't know who your audience is. I mean, you have some, but you, you don't have the granular information you have now with social. And the thing is that, again, you want to know your audience as well as you can. Uh, there's a guy, Bob Bentz. So see, I'm giving credit now. He's a go. digital marketer. He wrote a book with the concept. It was called Relevance Raises Response, which I love the concept. So that if you are looking not just for a car, but you're looking for an electric car that you know is made in America, all of a sudden your audience is pretty tight. Therefore, your messaging can be tighter and therefore it's more relevant and therefore it's going to raise that response. If I'm talking to you as this customer who wants these specific things and I'm talking straight to you, it ends up making it much more likely that you're going to engage than if you're just someone who's looking for a car. You're also going to make it, you know, if I'm trying to market to people who are looking for a car as opposed to someone who's looking for an electric car made in the U.S., it's going to be much easier to target those people and therefore craft my message, my story, to resonate with those people and what they care about. So it's it's always, you know, when I when I meet people and, and I say, "What do you do?" and they tell me, and I'm like, "Oh, and who's your audience?" and they say, "Everybody." It may be everybody, but that is I mean, not a marketing strategy I recommend to try and market to everybody. I mean, it's just it's too hard. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't literally market to everyone in in, in an actual sense because not everyone's going to like what you're pushing out. Not everyone's going right. to like you. Let's be honest. Everybody's not going to like you. It's okay. You don't have to like. I'm me. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I don't like you either. No, I, I love you. I love I love I love those who don't <laughs> like me either. It doesn't matter. But no, I'm just saying like. Sometimes, you know, you don't know who your audience is, especially when you're starting off, you know, uh, with a brand like you might have this idea of who your audience is. And it's good to have that baseline of a target market of who you think your uh, ideal um, demographics is. But once you start pushing things out there and you start getting data back and you start testing mm -hmm. and iterating and advertising, advertising and, and marketing, things like that, you start realizing, hey, look, you know what? Maybe this isn't my actual audience. For example, you have products, you know, even in tech that you've seen, you know, um, that are household names right now, like Snapchat, where, you know, you had Evan Spiegel of Snapchat, who literally started out, you know, advertising to his, you know, uh, frat and frat brothers right. and sorority, you know, uh, comrades in Stanford. And, you know, his app, Snapchat, wasn't doing so good. And he had another app before that that wasn't doing so good. And if it wasn't for the fact that he literally went to his mother, as the story goes, and told her about the actual app, and then she, you know, introduced it or told her his his nieces or whatever or cousins or whatever about the actual app, and then one of the cousins went to school and started using it as a note passing app where it would just disappear, right. and then he noticed an amazing spike of the app started being used, and then he was like, "Well, what the hell is this? Why is it at this morning time?" That there's there's immense growth. And before he knew it, he learned that literally that was the actual reaction or the uh, the takeaway is that his relative literally went to school 
and start using it as a tool that he didn't actually originally create it to do. And so it started marketing itself and gave its own life to itself. But he would have never thought about actually marketing that in that way. And even if he did, would have would it have have taken off is the thing, right? So it's like sometimes these intentional marketing strategies might not necessarily push you off. Sometimes it's just that that weird, weird, weird luck tragic. I don't know what you. I don't know what happy you accident. Well, yeah. I'll tell you something. I, I I agree with that to a certain point, and sometimes you learn stuff that you weren't expecting. But I think that I, I what I often say to people is that marketing, you know, because it's hard. People come to marketers and say. Where's the magic bullet to make this pop, to go viral, whatever it may be. And it doesn't work like that. You know, you, you know, things that end up exploding, there's usually some, you know, work that went on before it exploded. Of course. And I think the thing is that I, what I tell people is that marketing is part art and part science. And the science part requires that you experiment. I, I teach uh, social media marketing uh, at Temple University. And one of the concepts I try and drill into people is what I call the EMA, which is EMA. I'm into acronyms to try and make things easy for people to remember. <laughs> EMA, experiment, measure, adjust. So when people start whatever the marketing campaign is or social campaign, you're going to try. You're going to use the best evidence you have to try and get the best results. Invariably, you're going to get data. And data is great as long as you use it. A lot of people collect, I've had clients who collect lots of data and then it just sits somewhere. You need to take that data and analyze it to measure, you know, what works and what doesn't, and then implement it in the next iteration as you're talking about. I mean, that's product development. They're always iterating. And so I think it's important in your, to recognize up front that you're going to do some experimentation. You know, that that's part of the process of, that's part of the marketing strategy. That's a journey. Right. It, and then you learn as you go. And, and I always say the goal is always to get better. To optimize you know I, I i don't do a lot of digital marketing i do content creation but when i work with digital marketers my goal is always okay what did we learn what are you doing differently how are we getting are we are we progressing and as long as we're progressing then i'm like okay it's it's doing the journeys can as long as we're going forward in our journey then i'm okay with that but i think again it's being realistic about the fact that it, not everything's going to hit you know that's why a lot of people a b testing works because you figure out this you keep two things the same, you change one and oh wait, this one has this result. And therefore you're like, okay, do more of that. And then optimizing as you go is critical to having successful campaigns and marketing in general. At least that's my my uh, opinion and perspective. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you a lot on that topic or solution. Um, but then there's just, there, I mean, it's just these weird things sometimes. You know, I know you have to iterate, you know, measure, iterate, measure, iterate, and kind of do this whole cycle of, of uh, you know, uh, product discovery or marketing discovery, right? Um, in some way, because this is how you 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 grow and you learn, and these these lessons that you learn are I feel are massive in anything you do in the world as far as you know um, building a company. Because when you can build a brand, when you can market something, you have a lot of amazing power because you understand the 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 copy, you know, which is the the mm -hmm. the kind of the word you know, or messaging of the actual product. And then, you know, that also ha plays a part. And then the actual name, whatever you give it value of, right? That name has to have a story behind it. So even that story attaching to that matters a lot. So it's like, when you're building a company, you have to think about all these things and what's your distribution model or your demographics mm -hmm. and things like this. All this stuff has to come into play and it has to just be like this right sauce almost at some point and you just have to iterate and iterate and you need money and time sometimes to iterate some of those things, which is why a lot of big companies never actually, well, they've never, you, you can never know if there were big companies, but a lot of <laughs> potential companies that could have had a great potential, maybe never reach their full um, development, right? Because they didn't have that seating. Yeah. Iterate. I always think that there's lots and lots of great ideas. And, and my wife actually has had this experience where she's had ideas that we've then seen pop up. Right. And I said, yeah, well, it's a great, you had a great idea, but to be able to take that great idea and put the capital behind it to develop a prototype, to test it, to market, like it's not easy for, you know, us mere mortals to try and do that when we're going against the big corporate machines. And yes, you have the kind of unicorns of people that come out and they, they, you know, are able to get something in the zeitgeist and, and have it. But uh, I always think about, um, I'll give you two stories. One uh, that's, 
not mine. So there's a book called Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell. I've heard of it. And he tells a lot of stories about why certain people succeed and why others don't, even though they both have equal talent. So you've got two people who have equal talent, one becomes a success and one kind of has middle-aged success. And he had this concept of the 10,000 hours to become an expert. And he's saying, well, you, know, you know, so that the reason someone becomes a success who's talented and someone who doesn't become a success is because of the difference in the work. And there's an element of luck, you know, being in the right place at the right time. You know, he, he talks about um, Microsoft, you know, and Bill Gates. Bill Gates is a genius. There's no question about it. But he was in a, a place where he lived, where his parents, he had access to early computing that 99.9% .9 of the population didn't. And he took advantage of it. So it was both the circumstance and then the ability to leverage and take advantage of it. And not every, so you might have a great idea. If you don't work at it and find ways to, to continue to iterate, you know, slowly. I mean, so the second story is, um, have you heard of John Legend? Yeah, the singer? musician, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have a, a connection to him. He sang at my wedding because one of my best friends is one of his best friends. And they have a production company together. That is awesome. um, but I remember I went to see him play at one point. Um, and he, he tells us the story of his success. Because a lot of people look at him and think, oh, my God, John Legend became an overnight success. He went, you know, skyrocketed and won all these Grammys. He's actually an EGOT. You know what an EGOT is? No, explain. What is an EGOT? So there are only 16 of them ever. An EGOT is a, a, a label for someone who's won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. E-G-O-T, an EGOT. Wow. Only 16 people have ever done it. And John Legend is one of them. Guess he's a legend. <laughs> he is a legend. But one of the things he said was, so he was, you know, he went to Penn, which is where my friend Jackson met him. Penn State, yeah. And he actually, after he graduated, he, you know, went to Boston Consulting Group. and was a consultant. And he worked on his music and he was doing gigs and he was writing music for others and he would meet the right. And so he, his joke was, he was a, I think it was a nine year overnight success. So that everyone seems to think that someone became an overnight success, but they aren't aware of all the hard work and time that went in before they popped. John Legend, super talented guy. How come it took him nine years before he got a manager? He got a record deal. Like, it doesn't always just happen. It happened because he put in all. He's one of the hardest working people I've ever met. And he's also one of the most talented people I've ever met. <laughs> and you need both of those things to be a superstar. Um, but I think to be a success, you need to have a threshold of talent or surround yourself with those that are talented in what you want to do. And you got to put in the work. I mean, it's, you got to put in the work. These, you know, um, Evan Speaker, you talked about Snapchat. Yes, it popped because of circumstances, that happy accident. But he, if he didn't put in work from that moment of pop to make it what it became, it might never have become. So just because something happens you know that levels you up doesn't mean you're going to stay there or keep going unless you're smart enough to put in the time to put in the effort to surround yourself with the right people uh, so it's it's a lot there are a lot of ingredients in the recipe for success um, and sometimes i think people on the outside looking in only focus on one or two and, and then they either get discouraged or think you know i can't do it i think it, it, it takes a lot of different stuff um, and that's why there are lots of business books and, and otherwise uh, ways to keep at it. And, and one of the, I'm sorry, before I, I forget, I think one of the ingredients that's really important in all of this is what some people call passion or, you know, your why. Simon Sinek, Start With Why is great TEDx if you haven't seen it. He wrote a book called Start With Why. Companies that are successful understand why they do what they do. We buy from people who buy the why, not the what. And so any business that's going to be successful has to understand why they're doing it because that's what people buy into. Right. I mean, that's a part of the story. And it's also about passion and drive, which are, you know, soft skills and things like that. It's, it's imperative to do that. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, like, I mean, I think it's obvious that, you know, the writings on the wall and, you know, the experience and, a lot of these, you know, companies and brands and stuff like that have done these things. It's been this trial and tribulations that they've kind of just kept on going. That passion and, and endurance has kind of led them to, you know, uh, the success land. But then I, I see, especially here being in Silicon Valley, 
and then also growing up in the music industry and the entertainment industry and things like that, it's like I've seen it where you can have all this passion and drive. And like I said, a part of that recipe, you know, called life may fucking happen. I mean, someone may die. Someone might overdose. Someone might not have the right manager. They might not be connected to the right person. Or just sometimes somebody might just shelf you. I mean, John Legend is, is a legend to, you know, be where he is. And he's also, I would say, as you would say, a blessed person to uh, be able to, to have that position where he is. I'm not, you know, I wouldn't disassociate, you know, his talent. But at some point, you know, just to be able to begin to write for somebody, you have to have a connection mm-hmm. or end to be able to write for someone. You just can't write for somebody. So he had to make that bridge and he had to have that luck. There's so many different key components within that story and that journey to where it led to him being to who he is. I agree hundred percent, but I'm going to share a distinction. The difference between dumb luck and what I call smart luck. Dumb luck is when you're walking down the street, you look down, there's 10 bucks, you pick it up, you put it in your pocket. That's just dumb luck. Smart luck is you want to be an actor, take some acting lessons. You know, the point is that like, I agree with you. Some, you can't control the circumstances that may or may not come along the way. But you can do things to put yourself in a position to be successful. And so there are people who just have that dumb luck and become a superstar or become a huge success uh, for one reason or another. But for, again, most of us mere mortals, you have to work at something to be successful. You know, John Legend probably started talking to a lot of people and eventually maybe he got an in. But it didn't just happen, oh, my uncle happens to know, you know, Alicia Keys or, you know, um, Lauren Hill and, no, it's because he was working the rooms. He was gigging. He was so. I think a lot of us look at these success stories and go, "Well, they just were lucky, or they knew the right people," and that is true. That gives you a huge advantage if you know your uncle's a you know a producer or your you know aunt is you know a writer already. Um, but those people work it, and those that don't have it create it by continually to go at it. The other thing is that it's it's not, the recipe for success is not an exact science. So it's not like you do like the story path. Like you go A, B, C, and then you become successful. There are a lot of variables, as you said, and there are a lot of different advantages. And you see lots of people who have disadvantages that rise above. And so it, it's, there's no secret sauce. There's no secret formula, but there are some best practices. And that's why I talk about smart luck. You want to be successful in something? Start learning how to do it. Start networking. I, you know, I wanted to work in the entertainment industry. I loved movies, and I was like, and I didn't know anybody, didn't know one person. But what I started to do was be intentional. So I would say to people, people say, "What do you want to do?" And this is, you know, I've just come out of college. I said, "I want to work in the film industry." And they, oh, that's really hard. That was what most people said. Their response is, "Oh, that's really hard." And I was like, "Yeah, well, that's what I want to do, or that's what I'm going to do." I started to say. And what happened is eventually, I, that was the language, the intention. I would meet someone and say, they like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to work in the film industry. I'm like, oh, I know an agent. You do? Who is it? And can you introduce me? And so starting to be intentional about that and then listening for the opportunities and then taking advantage of them. So I think there is some um, ingredients to get you going, to get you in the right path. And then... Yeah, a lot of hard work and some luck. I'm not going to say there's no luck involved. It's a, it's an ingredient that unfortunately is elusive and plays a part. Right, totally. I mean, I think what you're talking about is, you know, you know, making your own luck, right? You know, help 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 increasing the frequency of your own luck. That is, right. you know, prepping yourself or putting yourself in a position to uh heighten the frequency of success. You know, um if if you want to be, you know, um a musician or you want to be a celebrity or star you need to be within a frequency or an area most likely that's going to help you put yourself in that situation or put yourself in a situation that's going to you know levitate you to where you can have that influence to be able to market yourself as such and then you're also talking about some things of almost some secret type of shit you know where it's like literally i'm putting myself in a position to where i'm believing who i am and i'm, I'm going around and I'm, I'm actually 
pronouncing that to people. Hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. So it's a little bit of marketing and some strategy of who I am. You're selling yourself 24 seven. That's a part of the deal. And just your social skills and your likability, you know, you're going out there selling yourself. Hey, look, you know, blah, blah, blah. This seems like a reasonable guy. Yeah. Jeffrey sounds like a really cool guy. You know what? I have a friend who does such and such. Oh, really? No way. Yeah. So Jeffrey, here you go. Let me introduce you to my friend. You know, they work with John Legend. You know, they work with you know, 50 cents. Now you're going to be a rapper or a filmmaker. Maybe you're going to produce the videos now. So I, I do believe in, you know, heightening the frequency of, of, mm -hmm. of luck, right? I mean, I, I don't believe that nothing comes without luck. And even when I talk about things like, you know, guys like Evan Spiegel and things like that, I'm not at the point to where I'm saying to that, you know, they're not doing the hard work because I understand the hard work and the hustle, but there's tons of people that really work fucking hard and they just sometimes don't get it. Again, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, it might not be the right team. You know, you might not have the right team to build that Facebook or that Google or to build or to be that John Legend. You might not have the right team or the right environment around you, things like that, or situation. There's so many different little pieces that, you know, that play to the story that you're actually going to, you know, put into fruition. You know, I, I, I just believe that as well. Yeah, I guess uh, the way I look at it is that. The hard work doesn't guarantee success, but it certainly increases the odds. I mean, th these sounds like these sound like book titles, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm working on one. <laughs> oh yeah, really? What's, yeah. It, what's it called? <laughs> Increasing the uh, odds. I, maybe I'll write that book as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean. Seriously, I mean, like, totally. I and I, I do. I'm serious about the book. I think you would make. You, you've mentioned a lot of great book titles as we actually spoke through the conversation. I've I've, I've picked up five. Um, you know, um, not plagiarizing or anything. Um, <laughs> I've credited most of verbal them, plagiarizing. Yeah, no verbal. I'm just saying, like, there, there's some there's some there's some good uh, some titles in there. You should be definitely a marketer within titles. Your your branding, uh, you know, little buzzwords just pop out with like nice little. Titles. I see titles. All I see is titles. I'm about branding. I'm about building shit. So when I hear certain things, I'm like, oh, wow, I can see. I'm very visual. I see like the future of how things can, you know, come into uh, reality, you know, manifest, you know. So like I, I can easily see where certain things like, oh, wow, that resonates. Boom. I can see that. I can see that. Okay, cool. This one. Yeah, I can definitely see it. Yeah, Jeffrey, you, you, you have something there. You have some power. That's something about your superpower is uh, definitely your. Uh, your way of words, um, you can come up with some really catchy uh, 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 titles. Yeah, um, yeah. Just give you credit right there. Um, but oh, yeah. thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I'm, I'm and that's it. another. So uh -huh, just give you appreciation's huge. You know, gratitude is enormous, and lots of people talk about it. And it's it's a um, it's a habit that can help you succeed. It's I think it's as simple as that. Gratitude is one of those things that a lot of people talk about it, not as many practice, you know, and I think it's the practice of gratitude that, you know, makes the impact. I agree with you. And, you know, I want to also ask you some questions too, as well. You also said you do production or film. Like, what do you do in the mm -hmm. film industry or like, what, what, what's your deal? Tell us. Uh, so I don't work in the quote unquote film industry. I, I did. So, when I'm, uh, I left after my second year of law school, people joke I was a law school dropout and I moved to California. Um, I did finish my law school credits. So I have a law degree, never been a lawyer. I always say in the next life, but I worked, my first job was in the story department at United Talent Agency, where I read a lot of bad scripts. <laughs> um, and then I was fortunate I got a job from there working for the head of production at Paramount Pictures and, and then subsequently for the head of uh, production at MGM Studios. And I was, you know, the little cog in the machine. My boss was really powerful. So we basically, any project that came through our doors from development, buying the script, rewriting the script, casting, production, post-production came through our office. So my job is to help the process run more smoothly and oftentimes get shouted out by producers who are not happy with something that was happening. Um, I then met and fell in love with a girl if I'm going to tell you my little story. And uh, I ended up moving to her hometown, Manchester, England, where I started a real estate company because it's what my father-in-law did. And uh, I enjoyed it, but it was not, I didn't have passion for it. And so I, I got eventually was, I'm like, I'm not fulfilled. I need to do something more creative. 
So I ended up getting into marketing because it really married my right and left side brains, you know, strategic and creative. And I worked for a design agency in Manchester, England that did websites and branding and loved it. Uh, and then when I moved to Philadelphia, back to Philadelphia, I started to work for a brand marketing agency and I drank the Kool-Aid of brand, you know, um, and the Simon Sinek and those things in terms of your story and, and being consistent and living your brand. And then about five years ago, I decided to start my own company. And the joke was, I'm like, what do you need? You know, <laughs> like, um, and we did everything from logos to websites to SEO. And I had partners that would help. And over the last um, 18 months to two years, I now focus on visual content. So we tell visual stories. That's what we do. And primarily through video and my favorite is animation. So I was people who goes, oh, so what do you use when you animate? And I'm like, I don't use anything. I use the computer to contact my animators. You know, I'm a producer. So my job, I am an ideation guy. So I do come up with a lot of the ideas and I do write uh, lots of the scripts that we use. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not an animator. I'm not a designer. I have a team that are really talented. And my job is to work. I was looking at myself as an interpreter between my business client and my creative team. You know, so the business client doesn't quite understand the creative process and my creative team doesn't always understand the nuances of business. That's my job to communicate between the two, to figure out what it is, the objective that the client wants, and then try and deliver it through the creative process. And I love it. And so that's, I produce that corporate animation, business animations, explainer videos, those kinds of things, um, brand videos. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Wow, kind of like the the old Twitter uh, Twitter uh, uh, explanation videos. What is Twitter and things like mm -hmm. that? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I've actually done uh, uh, you know two of those myself. Um, speaking of the, 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 the well, of the, what I always tell thing. people about you know there are tools out there that you can use to create animations, and I would say yes, and unless that's you know you really put a lot of time and energy in it, I can create you an animation. It will take me twice as long and be half as good. Or I can have people who are really good at it, you know, up the quality and make sure it's awesome. Yeah, that's, what I would always do is I would just go ahead and I would write the script. I would envision the script, what the brand is, and I would just write it over and over again. And then once I had the script, I already had the vision of how the voice would sound, if it was gonna mm -hmm. be a British voice, or if it was gonna be a New York voice, or whatever voice, it moved, female voice, I already knew what that was gonna be like. And I would look for that person, you know, on Fiverr or something like that with that certain voice, and then I would already have the script already written. I already mm -hmm. visualize exactly how it would be and you know who would be what and what kind of people. And, and I would have like this whole theme already panned out. And then I would just tell them, hey, look, it's going to be like this. There's going to be these kids and there's going to be these people. And they're going to be playing on the phone. And then they're going to be like, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? Oh, I'm using HeyChat. And this app does this. And it does this. And da-da-da. Oh, wow, really? Well, now you can do this. And now such and such learned about this. And he learned about his friend who rode a bike. And he learned about such and such. And now he's telling a visual story. Wow, now you can do this on this app called HeyChat, you know, et cetera. So it, it you know, just sound really you know, nice and energetic, but then also fun and, and to get people intrigued. And you know, yeah. I really kicked ass in those. But... I just, uh, it, it, it's not something that I was actually, I never wanted to build a company doing so. It's just a talent, mm -hmm. you know, a, a storytelling talent. I like, I'm a creator, right? And I feel like, I feel like all people are creators, but some people just have more creative juice. I would uh, echo that. You know, I, I consider myself, you know, um, I, wor I worked out of WeWork for a, a while and nice. um, they, I had a shirt that said creator on it. And I, I wore it with pride because even though I'm not the one who's creating the cell or I'm creating stuff. Something wasn't there. I come up with an idea. I work with a team and we produce something that you can then use and tell that story. And then that process to me is, is what gives me joy, you know, starting with nothing, coming up with an idea, writing it and just manifesting it, it and putting it into put, reality, putting it out there. Yeah. I mean yeah. like even, if, you know, even with me, but doing the whole podcast thing, like I'm literally doing, you know, starting off doing like about seven or six different, you know, professions, you know, there's a, sound engineer, <laughs> you know, I'm doing that with logic and things like that. I'm, you know, I'm also, you know, doing, you know, the engineering and the tech technical setup of the actual cameras. And I'm also, uh, you know, calibrating the cameras itself, doing the actual color correction. You know, I'm also doing the video editing. I'm also doing, 
you know, the whole setup, you know, and the, the technical setup of, you know, doing things remote, you know, and then the lighting, that's a whole nother thing, lighting technique. Um, and then there's, you know, what are the right tools that you would actually use to actually push this out? And then what are, you know, the settings that you need to actually compress the actual video and to get the clarity that you want? And then how do you actually, you know, create up a, a, an actual system? Then you need the branding. And then within that branding, you need the actual, uh, the, the name, right? And then you need the, the social media marketing. So it's like so many different layers that go into a lot of moving parts. Exactly. But everybody just, I, I see people, Oh, you know, I just have my phone. I'm like, fuck, that's, a, that's amazing that you just have your fucking phone. It's like, I feel like the game has changed. Like there's so much great content out there and it's like YouTube and things like that were crest really, you know, top tier quality. I mean, if you want to put, I feel like if you want to put yourself, it's kind of like what we talked about. If you want to put yourself up there to where you need to be, you need to prepare yourself and I feel like you should you should be aiming to iterate consistently. And what I've always done with the podcast is I look at it as a product of anything is to start off, you know, iterating consistently, you know, looking at what you're doing, understanding the market, mm-hmm. understanding what you're trying to do, and then iterating, looking for mistakes and looking where you can improve. And then also looking for, you know, those inspirational or, you know, um, competitive analysis out there with the, 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 the brands that you feel like, you know, connect with you and, and, and that you kind of like, you know, um, admire. And then you kind of just, you know, iterate and twist until you feel like you get like to, for me, I feel like get to a baseline to where you feel like your quality is up to par. And you look at different things like the visuals. Is your, are your visuals that good? Your conversation. Mm-hmm. Anything that may entail a great conversation or podcast or show in general and then kind of like mark each one off. What, what what number do I think I'm at? You know, and for me, I kind of always want to be at at least ninety percent on each tier, right? Mm. And until I'm there, I don't feel comfortable. You know, when I first got into this, oh. I was like, my the conversation point wasn't there. I was using a lot of uh and huh and you know uh yeah, uh, just weird little ad libs and just uncomfortableness <laughs> on the camera. It was a bunch of different things. But you were saying something. Well, I- uh, yeah, I was going to share. So I, I, I have a podcast of which I'm doing season five. I batch them nine episodes each. And if I look at the last episodes compared to the first couple episodes, there's no question I've gotten better because practice, you get better at things. You know, the more conversations you have, you understand what works and what doesn't work. Uh, you learn better how to promote it better. You know, and there are all these different things that you, by putting in the time and putting in the effort, you get better at it. And as a lifelong learner, I'm always going to strive to be better. And I'm always going to strive to raise the bar um, and push myself. At the same time, there's a concept that I really uh, believe in, which is what I call imperfect action. So I think there are some people who don't create because they want everything to be so picture perfect that it stops them and the, you know, it's, you know, perfection is the enemy of the done. Um, not my quote. I know we're really important about giving credit. So I, am not sure who said it, but it wasn't <laughs> me. I'm just curating the content. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of times people need to just go do it and then, and then, you know, and be willing to screw up and that's okay. Cause it's, to me, what's really important in storytelling is being genuine. So if you're, you know, you, whether even if it's just your iPhone and you're being genuine about it and being vulnerable, that's going to resonate with people. And so I think that's an important piece of getting things done. I mean, that resonates with me. That resonates with me. And it's funny because, you know, I don't know, years ago I had this dream, you know, of myself. And it was literally, literally weird. I had a dream of myself. I never had a dream of myself, first of all. It was really, I don't know if that's egotistical or what, but it was really odd. I had a dream of myself. I was in complete darkness complete blackness of space and then there was just like a little light coming towards me and the closer the light got to me it was my face but like perfect everything was nice and young no scratch no scar no nothing was on my face everything was perfect teeth were perfect everything was perfect and just told myself hey you need to create this you need to move to california and you need to do these things and you know at the end of the dream it said hey I know, you know, this, I know you, and I know this, I know you, I know you think this is a dream, but there's one thing important that I need you to do when you wake up. And this is the most important thing out of everything I told you. 
You have to promise me that you just start. Just start. No matter what you remember, just start. And I woke up sweating. Like, what the fuck? And I went and told my roommate, I was like, dude, I just had this fucking wicked dream. <laughs> <laughs> like a Sterner fucking movie, right? I was like, dude, I just had this weird. And I don't even do, I don't do weed. I don't do shit like that. But not, not disrespecting anybody who does that, but I don't. So I was just like, but just like a Stoner video, I was like, dude, what the fuck? I had this dream. I was in myself. And like, I was, it was crazy, man. It was so spooky. Mm. And I told myself just to start. So now I'm just like starting, you know, it said it knew me and I said, I it. just need to start. So it's just like. That was the most weirdest, vivid dream I've ever had in my freaking life. And it's, it's reality. That dream changed my whole fucking life. Weird, right? Are you a Star Wars fan? I am a Star Wars lover, yes. So when you were telling that story, it just reminded me of Luke Skywalker fighting Darth Vader. Uh, the dream he had where he's fighting Darth Vader. And then he, he, he the, takes off the mask and it's him. Uh, oh shit <laughs> that's creepy yeah 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 i get it so i saw some parallels I get, there i get a correlation like, of that you, one he saw himself you need to yeah. Know, yeah you gotta know yourself before you can go and fight your enemies as it were sometimes the enemy you have to fight is yourself is yourself that's deep um, yeah yeah but what's that's what's, what's, george what's, lucas just to give credit to you, i didn't do star wars <laughs> of course of course i mean maybe you did i mean unless he unless he plagiarized you know uh, I, I mean no 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 i mean i get it but like even just to me i guess what i'm saying is like you know, um, that dream changed even my trajectory on life. Because mm -hmm. now I just always, ever since then, I've re it's like awoken this thing like, hey, don't fucking, you know, procrastinate. Don't think about it. Just start. So now I've just like led my life with just fucking starting. Instead of thinking about it, just, just start and figure the shit out on the way. Just keep on building blocks. You know, like you read Hoffman of LinkedIn, you know, jumping off of a building and assembling a plane while you're falling down. Is, is how I've led my, you know, my life. And so people say, Hey man, how'd you do this? And how'd you get this? And how'd you, I'm like, dude, I just fucking start. I just start and I just analyze it and I just keep on iterating consistently until I get better. I look and I look for, I, I look for key identifiers and see where I feel weaknesses are. And I try to embrace them and then also push my strengths as I'm going. And you know, I just keep on going. I just keep going. Just got to keep going. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was reminded, uh, you, you said you're awakened. So, you know, there's a Star Wars called The Force Awakens. So that's what happened to you. Oh, to the, bring it all back the, to Star maybe, Wars. I think the Force, <laughs> I think the Force, I think the Force woke me up, you know? I mean, which is irony. I always make a joke to people, hey, may the Force be with you. So, you know, hey, hey. Yeah, there you hey go. I, I started doing that about like two or three years ago just because I was watching one of these uh, uh, Star Wars movies. It's like, you know, hey, may the Force be with you. Because I know it's not everybody believes in you know, God, not everybody had believes in the same thing. So I just say, you know, just to be more balanced, made that force, you know, it's just so I'm not. I, yeah, I think the reason you. that movies resonate with so many people is because the concept is appealing. You know, there's lots of versions of the force that people have names and labels for. But I think the idea is that whatever you may believe in, believe in yourself. And that's kind of the universe, you know, having having that courage and, and being awakened to whatever your strengths are or does the universe reward you for taking that risk or being mm -hmm. yourself you know maybe the universe rewards you for creating it's something i believe i believe the universe rewards you for for creating but it doesn't come without trials and tribulations or friction or adversity you know at first i feel like the universe has this major struggle point when you try to change who you are the universe feels like it it's trying to correct itself like hey wait Jeffrey belongs here. What the fuck are you doing? No, 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 no. Go back. Right. Jeffrey, you're fucking up. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, back up. <laughs> you belong over here. And you feel like this major friction. You're like, and it's that friction that makes you want to give up. It's that friction that makes you want to give up. But if you keep on tapping at it and tapping, eventually the universe just says, hey, wait a minute. All right, Jeffrey, fuck, dude. You belong here. Just get over here now. We put you in the wrong section. Well, I, I ascribe to a quote from John Lennon. Not legend. Uh, okay, his, we we got a lot of Johns. Not going John. On. Not not John some, Legend. Do you have an obsession Lennon with Johns? <laughs> your, what's your dad's name? Richard. Ah, okay. I thought it would be John. <laughs> now, if my son's name was John, that would make more sense. It but, would. Uh, yeah. No Johns in the family. Not either. Just Richards. His name's Ethan. Okay. I need Johns in my mom, not really. Yeah, I don't I think Ethan's Johns. another. You know, he, Johns represent that. You know, 
guide. I don't know. So John Lennon had a quote where he said, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. Oh, wow. Yeah. And heard so this. it's, it's about that. Like you can have the best you know, plans Plan. yeah. and then you need to see the signs and realize things are going to happen differently. Um, it reminds me, of my, I've used this quote in a bunch of podcasts, so I apologize <laughs> that I'm using it again, but it's so good, um, which is, and again, Mike Tyson as a, as a powerful force and character. I love this one. He said, he said, <laughs> right, we all have got a plan until we get punched in the face. Do <laughs> <laughs> we get knocked out? Yeah, I love that one. That was hilarious too. Or it's like, it's, you know, I think there's another one too. Um, we all have a plan and um and god laughs at it or something like that there's another one like that too right yeah <laughs> yeah i think again you have to be you know resilient and and you gotta and flexible you gotta roll the punches on it you should have a good plan but realize it's probably not gonna go according to plan but you gotta iterate i think the thing is is like yeah. you have to iterate things might not go exactly how you planned but that doesn't mean that you still can't reach the goal right I the goal that. just might Definitely. be a little bit different from what you envision and then also, maybe the universe or God, whatever you want to believe, maybe it already knows who you need to be, and you just don't. So it's like when people tell me, like, hey, man, you know, do you believe in destiny or do you believe in, you know, self, you know, um, I mean, do you believe in, like, will, right? I'm like, yeah, you know, honestly, I kind of believe in both in a way. I believe that we think it's our will because we don't know the fucking end of the story, so it feels like will. But then I also believe and you know a destiny that the universe or god already knows the actual you know answer and he already had it planned out before you so therefore we have simultaneously we believe in will because that's all we know because we don't know the end but the god or the universe or itself whatever you want to call it knows the destiny it already knows the end it already knows the beginning and already knows the end because none of it exists for it right so it's just like yes and no it's just depending on relative to you right versus a, a, a god or a universe whatever you want to call it that consciousness that's aware of itself understands that hey look this is where you're gonna go i already know the fucking answer but you don't know it so it, <laughs> it will always feel like will to us well i'll i'll, I'll my, try and plus thing. that which is that uh, you know you said something as we don't know the end and i think there's a i, I like quotes if you haven't figured that out yet i'm a big fan of quotes um, but and it's a concept, which is the journey is the destination. Mm. And I think that's what we sometimes lose. We're so focused on what is over there. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have goals and, but we need to make sure we're also embracing the journey. I mean, is the I journey, is, is the journey, I feel like you're right. Cause the journey is about, you know, it's about the lesson, right? You know, you have a job or a mission, right? And then you also have a lesson in life. That's they're, 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 they kind of, they're kind of, uh, you know, um, they kind of like correspond or they kind of connect or, you know, with each other in some way they overlap, right. Per se. And what I mean by that is like, I believe everybody has their mission slash job, but then they also have their own lesson, which is independent in a way, but on that journey and mission and job, you actually learn a lesson. And if you don't learn that lesson, then, you know, that that's not a part of your, uh, you didn't get the gig. You didn't get the gig. It's, it's time to do your thing. Maybe, maybe you have to do this again or you just to fuck up. I don't know what it is, but you know, it, it, there's a lesson to it. And I feel like within your mission and job, there's a lesson to it. And when it's kind of over, you're kind of over. And that's just kind of how I, I look at things, you know? So I feel like, you know, and, and I've seen that, you know, and, and I've, I've, I've made a lot of visual studies on people's lives and I've always, I've just seen this pattern to where everything kind of like interacts with each other and there's some type of like takeaway from it, you know, like somebody's father died, you know, um, but it also caused them to react differently in life and to reflect things in, in life differently. And maybe their job is to learn, you know, what that variance is, is, but at the same time, their mission is to help other people in some other certain ways, you know, through that actual, um, lesson. Getting deep on me, man. I know we got to go deep. We got to go deep, Jeffrey. We got to go deep. <laughs> That's just what we I do. I think we got pretty deep. I like we it. We got to do it. We got we got to get deep into the mind. You know, deep minds, right? That's a that's an AI type of, uh, of 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 logic. You know, it's just like, what is that? You know, what is consciousness? What is spirituality? What is the world? What is creativity? And how does the universe use us to create? You know, and mm -hmm. I feel like you know, we as beings, we're just creative creatures, and we're just here just to create and to manifest and to 
give these lessons. And that's just pretty much what we awesomely always do. We're always creating things. And as kids, we're always creating things. And like I said earlier, I believe that some people are just a little bit more creative than others, but it doesn't mean they're more important than the other. It just means they're a little bit more. I definitely echo that. Can I ask you a question about names and things? Because we've talked about titles. And so the title of this podcast, The Kids in the Room, what's the story behind that? That is awesome. Jeffrey doing a little bit of podcasting. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a podcaster <laughs> himself, so he's doing a little prying. Great question. Great question. Great question, by the way. Um, I get asked this a lot, but it's always a great question when somebody's intrigued and wants to really know and they see that and you understand branding. So let me dig into it. Let's do it. Yeah. So for me, the whole vibe of the kids in the room is, you know, when I was, you know, and I think it's, it's not just me. It's not just me. I feel like everybody, when we were kids, we were just curious mm -hmm. and, you know, you were in your room, you were playing games, you were talking with your friends. And you just said anything that came in mind and you were allowed to have that freedom and openness and, you know, uh, of, of ideation, of creativity, of, you know, of, of pros and cons and dismissals of ideas and conversations or whatever. And you just were exchanging information and it was just more freely. Right. And you just learn from each other, you know, whether you were talking about a guitar and, you know, the riffs that you were learning, you were just like, you know, you were talking about music and artists, John Legend. You know, um, you know, uh, you know, just all of these great things that you might just want to come up with. It was just this random conversation that just ended up getting somewhere that you didn't think it would be. And I loved that. You know, I love that in general. And I think we, you know, I miss that. And I think people miss that. I think people resonate towards that because we've all done that. We've all sat around since the beginning of time with campfires and just told these stories and just trade mm -hmm. information. This is how we communicate. This is how ideas happen is we just sit around and we start conversating naturally and we start talking about, oh, yeah, well, what about this? And did you see this? Or what do you think about this person? Or what did you think about this? And we're just we're creating things when we're exchanging information. Our minds, like you were talking about these stories, you know, our minds are just like we're intrigued by these great storytellers. And I just feel like, you know, when you're in that room, you're – you're just really just like, you're more honest. You're more honest mm -hmm. and you're more vulnerable and you're more humble. And there's just this like, I don't know, this transparency that I feel that happens when you're mm -hmm. just kids in the room versus being adults in the room because you're always trying to politically correct yourself. You don't want to say the bad words because you might get killed from the sponsors. You're just, <laughs> you know, you're just, you're just hypercritical towards yourself. And it's just like, that doesn't allow you to just to be honest and that doesn't allow others to grow. And I think... Those conversations are always just so fucking fun. Yeah. I so. love it. It reminds me of uh, one of my other favorite quotes. As I told you, I love quotes. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, giving credit. Um, he had a quote where he said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. There you go. There you go. Uh, and that, the that, kids in the room. that's the kids in the room. That is definitely it. It's it's. It is that 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 innocence, man. And so for me, that's exactly why do I do the podcast? I want that innocence back, and I just want to get people relaxed to have these conversations. And this can inspire, educate, and create openness for people that listen to the actual podcast. You know, I think people miss these things. These are natural things I feel that us humans do, which is why people listen to podcasts in general. But my take on it is a different type of vibe. You know, educate and inspire, and you know, create that openness. Love it. There you go. That's it. Guys. <laughs> yeah, man. But I, I definitely dig it, man. I dig it. Um, it's been great having you on the actual podcast. I think we've learned some 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 pretty awesome shit, some, some awesome conversations, some inspirational conversations. I definitely have to have you back on again another time and uh, we can pick up some some new shit and, and, and talk about some interesting things that we've, you know, um, I don't know, uh, experienced through life. And uh, maybe you might have one it. of these. Thank you out. so much for having me. Oh, yeah. yeah, anytime. But, you know, I need you to write this quote book, right? Because if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. Because I've actually been in the back burner. I've been thinking about this for years, like quote book, quote book. And I was literally like writing like little quotes. And it's like quote book, quote book, quote book would sound so fun. But I don't know if it's. Well, I'm, I'm, I am going to create. So I, I've got a, a new project I'm working on and I want to have a few more in the can. So uh, I'm a big fan of kinetic typography, uh, which is words in motion. And so I came up with this concept. So I am trademarking here live on this podcast. 
So I'm going to be having a poor a man's copyright called, trademark. Poor man's cr- trademark. What? You hear that guy? <laughs> lawyer right guy. That's a lawyer right there. <laughs> lawyer yeah. guy. Pay attention. Uh, called quote motion. And so it's going to be some of my favorite quotes in motion. Quote motion. Awesome. That is great. That is great. Yeah, Coming. we definitely got to trade book ideas when we get mm. those books going. Because right. I've got, I, I already have a book that's been in play. I, you know, it's in my five year plan. It's not something I want to push out immediately. I think I want to do this podcast and have some great times doing this and even grow any further and help inspire others as well. And then just give them my secret recipe. I love it. I love what you're doing. Awesome. awesome. Well, appreciate you coming on the show, Jeffrey. May the force be with you. So just hang on for a second uh, while we get this to upload. And uh... Ladies and gentlemen, the Kids in the Room podcast. The Kids in the Room podcast. That's right. That's right. Brought to you by Moo Faces TV. Let's, Let's go. go.